If you want talk, games, and fun all rolled into one, well, you've come to the right place. This is The Game Show, where host Bradley Clark and his special guests talk about the world of television game and competition shows. But Bradley's guests aren't here to just talk. They came to play a game as well. What will today's topic be? What game does Bradley have planned? There's only one way to find out. It's time to start the show. You heard the man. Welcome to The Game Show. And here's your host, the Bradster himself, Bradley Clark. Will you accept this new episode of The Game Show? Thank you so much, Austin Angelo, and welcome everybody to another exciting episode of The Game Show, the talk show all about the world of television game and competition shows. I'm Bradley Clark, and if you're a fan of a certain reality show series, you should definitely know the reference I made during my opening line. If you have no idea what Will You Accept This New Episode of The Game Show is hinting at, well, have you ever heard the phrase, Will You Accept This Rose? I'm betting that you have, because it's now become one of the most well-known catchphrases in television history. Anna B. Anna, will you accept this rose? Yes. However, my guest doesn't just direct cocktail parties and rose ceremonies, as he's also been seen in the credits during these shows. It's time to play Family Feud! Introducing the Evans Family, ready for action! All the way from Kansas City, Missouri, it's the Giefer Family, on your marks! And now, here's your host, he's simply irresistible, John O'Hurley! The star of the hit comedy, Blackish, Anthony Anderson and his family, playing for the Watts Willowbrook Boys and Girls Club. And the stars of Braxton Family Values, Grammy Award winning Tony Braxton and her family, playing for Lupus LA. And now, the star of our show, Steve Harvey. Connection. The classic show is back, and it's hotter, wilder, and more shocking than ever. Right? It's easier than ever to get a date, but no one seems to be making a love connection. Okay, that's all about to change. We're taking things back to basics. Real people matched by our team of experts who will be telling us every detail of their first date. No ghosting allowed, all right? Earlier this week, we sent two sexy singles on three dates each, and in a few moments, we're going to get the dish on everything that went down. The good, the bad, and the incredibly awkward. However, there is a $10,000 twist, which could change everything, right? Welcome to the Shark Tank where entrepreneurs seek an investment to start, grow, or save their business. We had a $100,000 loss that year. Whoa! If the Sharks hear a great idea... Party shirt. They'll invest their own money. It's really good. Ah! <laughs> and fight each other for a deal. Here's my offer and excludes Robert. Barbara writes on a stone tablet. But the entrepreneurs must get the full amount they're asking for, or they'll walk away with nothing. $200,000 for the entire business. Are wow. you nuts? This is a piece of crap. Who are the sharks? They're self-made business experts worth billions. 
Kevin O'Leary is a shrewd venture capitalist who made his fortune selling a children's educational company for over $4 billion. Barbara Corcoran went from waiting tables in Manhattan to building the city's premier $2 billion real estate empire. Robert Herjavec, son of an immigrant factory worker, founded one of the world's preeminent cybersecurity firms. Lori Grenier, the queen of QVC, holds over 100 patents and has launched over 400 products, grossing over a half a billion dollars in sales. And Mark Cuban, renowned billionaire tech mogul and the outspoken owner of the Dallas Mavericks. Yep, my guest is responsible for capturing all of Mr. Wonderful's superb statements, and for that, all of us Shark Tank fans say thank you. As you heard, he's also directed shows like Family Feud, Celebrity Family Feud, and Love Connection. Please welcome game show and reality TV show director, Ken Fuchs. Ken, thank you so much for joining me on the game show. Oh, my pleasure. It is such a pleasure to have you on the game show. And just to fill in some gaps for the listening audience, Ken also directs the TBS game show The Misery Index, starring Jamila Jamil and the Tenderloins, a.k.a. the Impractical Jokers Sal, Joe, Murr, and Q. And I had the pleasure of working alongside Ken during the season two production. And another ABC show with Fremantle, To Tell the Truth, with Anthony Anderson. I did that this year. I think it's their fifth year. It was my first. Were you able to guess the correct people during the games that you directed? No, it's really tricky. It's so fun to play along. And the imposters do such a great job. It's really a great show. Well, over the days we worked together, I built up a lot of questions that I wanted to ask you about your game show and reality show directing career. And I'm glad that I get to ask those questions to you today on The Game Show. So we're going to talk about many of the shows you directed over the years. And then later on for the game of the day, I am bringing back a game show from the past that you directed, and you'll have the lucky opportunity to go from the director's chair to the contestant's podium. So, Ken, are you ready for me to direct my first question to you? Yeah. Well, here it is. So I always like to start off by asking many of my guests, were you a game show fan growing up? And if so, what were some of your favorite game shows to watch? Absolutely. I watched everything. I'd come home from school or go to my friend's house after school and watch game shows. That was such a big part of the 60s television landscape. And a few stand out to me. Beat the Clock, for sure, I loved. And we also watched Match Game. I loved Match Game. And I'm presuming, as many game show fans are, you enjoyed other forms of non-scripted television as well. And that's what ultimately influenced you to make a career out of your interests? Yeah, game shows, talk shows, stand-up comedy, music, variety. That's really where I cut my teeth in variety television of all forms. And everything in that genre, anything under that umbrella was exciting to me. And now with the resurgence of all these games, it's been really fun and a great time. For me personally, I love seeing all of these game show reboots because as someone who wants to host game shows for a living, these shows prove that TV executives are still thinking about game shows and they are still a major force for network programming. Well, they always say that's sort of the genre that'll never go away. I mean, obviously now it's more popular than ever, but it's never really gone away completely. There's always been an audience for it, and it's good, efficient, cost-effective programming. And I'll tell you a bit of game show history. When I started in this business, the earliest job I had, I hooked up with this guy named Jay Reddick, and Jay Reddick was a producer and writer on the original Hollywood Squares. And Jay was brilliant, one of the funniest guys I've ever met. And we're still in touch. And Jay really gave me my start. I went from washing his car to end up stage managing a show for him. And he got me in the DGA and really helped me very much those first years, very loyal. And he was an original Merrill Heater guy. And Jay went on to much success on other shows. But that's where it all began for me, was game shows. And here we are 35 years later, and game shows are stronger than ever. It's great to see for you and I, guys like us. That's right. True game show fans. True game show fans. In May of 2000, Survivor premiered on television, and it was an instant success. Now, this was America's first taste of a reality competition show. So did seeing how popular Survivor was that first season make you think that there would be more reality competition shows to follow? And did you have an idea at that point that you wanted to become a reality TV director? 
it wasn't particularly on my radar. It was more sort of a chance meeting with the Bachelor folks about a year or two later that led me to my relationship with them. I'm sure I watched it, but yeah, I hadn't really thought about necessarily working in reality. And on March 25th, 2002, The Bachelor premiered on television with the first season of The Bachelorette premiering on January 8th, 2003. Brad fact! Now, have you been directing The Bachelor and The Bachelorette since the very beginning? I started in Bachelorette 1, Trista's year, so it was actually the third season of the franchise. And you also directed the ABC special Trista and Ryan's Wedding, which was the first ever Bachelor franchise wedding, correct? Right. We've done a few weddings, Molly and Jason, Ashley and JP. Tristan Ryan was the biggest for sure. When you first heard of the premise of The Bachelor, that one single man would be introduced to a number of single ladies and by the end of the journey there would be a proposal, what did you think of it? I'm up for anything. Nothing surprises me anymore on television. It's too hard to predict what works and what doesn't. And sometimes you see shows or you hear premises about shows that seem far-fetched and then they strike a chord. And then other times you work on a show or you're involved in a show that's just incredible and it just doesn't catch on. It doesn't do well. A lot of it's timing. Good shows get pitched at the wrong time or come out too early and then society's not ready for it. And then it just strikes a chord at the right time and it's hard to predict that. So I've sort of gotten out of the prognostication business and just do the work and enjoy the work and the people around me. Since The Bachelor had already been on TV for two seasons, did you think that ABC would do a role reversal show and create The Bachelorette? As a director, I'm sort of less involved in the development process, so it seemed like a natural fit and it's done well. It's been a great thing and why not make it equal across genders? The Bachelor and The Bachelorette are filmed at various locations throughout a season, from The Bachelor Mansion to dates around Los Angeles to different cities across America and countries around the world. So are there multiple directors throughout the season on the different locations and you only direct episodes shot in specific locations? Or are you the director throughout the entire season? We have a team. We have a great team of four directors. It's just too much for one person to do. It's way too much going on to be able to prepare and be everywhere at all times. So we have a really great team of uh, directors working with me, and they handle a lot of the dates mostly. And then I'm more involved in the rose ceremonies and those cocktail party rose ceremony nights. So we kind of divide it up a little bit that way. It makes it more manageable and gives us a chance to scout and prep locations. And with the travel now, we need to sort of leapfrog a little bit to cover everything. A lot of footage is filmed during each shoot, especially the first night when the lead is meeting all of the contestants. Now, on a game show, you direct from your seat in the control room. And for the most part, you know how the footage is going to turn out. However, since the Bachelor franchise doesn't follow a script or content rundown, Do you also do directing work in post-production and help piece together the footage you got? I'm not terribly involved on the post end. It's so much footage to cull through, and that's really more the producers and the story team. I'm a little bit more involved in the storytelling at the moment. So it's sort of like taking the cameras and audio and art department, lighting, and creating an environment and a scene and a situation where these people can carry on with the premise of the show and sort of enhance that story through visual storytelling. And then once it heads off to post, it's sort of like another group that does a great job with that. But I work more closely with the lighting designer and the production designer, more regarding the look and feel of the show than necessarily the content. Very different than a game show in that respect. Do you ever suggest to the producers of the show that it would be great if certain conversations were in specific locations or suggest a location in the mansion for, say, the lead to hand out the first impression rose? No, not too much. I mean, it really is kind of, we're just flying by the seat of our pants a little bit because you never know what's going to happen. And the best stuff is always spontaneous. And there's very few scenes that we shoot that you're aware that you're making a television show. We try to be more subtle and have a smaller footprint in terms of the fact that these people are out dating and having real conversations. And that's one of the tricks is to try to stay in the background as much as possible. Are you ever surprised regarding the information the contestants decide to share with the lead on national television? Because there are many instances when personal information is told as if millions of people weren't watching. 
again, nothing surprises me. I'm not 25 or 30, so I'm not really in that dating world. But from what I understand from my sons, this is sort of par for the course and that it's just a different time and era than when I was in my 20s. So yeah, sometimes it's surprising and then other times it's refreshing because they're having real conversations and not worried about the fact that they're on a TV show. So I think that authenticity is sort of what makes the show work best. You mentioned you're involved with directing the rose ceremonies. Does The Bachelor or Bachelorette ever discuss with you the order in which they're going to hand out the roses? Or do you go into directing the rose ceremony not knowing who is getting a rose? We have an idea of going into it so we can get the shots, but that's one of the few things that we kind of talk to them about. But no, they're really on their own. We want them to find love and obviously have a happy ending, and we're all for helping that happen. And they're really very much on their own. And obviously the goal of the series is for the lead to find love, but the first two seasons of The Bachelor didn't end up with a marriage. It wasn't until the marriage of the first Bachelorette, Trista Wren, and her chosen one, Ryan Sutter, which we talked about before, that we had a Bachelor franchise couple work. So seeing a Bachelor franchise couple actually get married, was this a moment where you and other production members realized that this unconventional process of finding love could actually work for people? Well, not only could work, it did work. So I think that was critical, not just for our team. It certainly gave the show energy, but it gave the franchise credibility. I mean, nobody could ever say, oh, that'll never work. It was very fortuitous that that happened so early because that was a great moment for us. And yeah, once it worked once, then all bets were off. And you can never wonder, if is this going to work? The Bachelor franchise has spawned numerous spinoff series, including Bachelor Pad and The Bachelor Winter Games, which you have directed as well as the popular Bachelor in Paradise and the most recent spinoff, The Bachelor Presents Listen to Your Heart. As a director, is it a challenge working on spinoffs because the audience expects the same great results as the original series? Or is it more fun because you get to try out new things while building off of the success of the original series? You know what? It's all fun. I love what I do. We're really lucky to get to work on the show with people I love. And a lot of the same crews and production people work on all the shows. So it's really quite a family we've built up. And yeah, the new shows are fun too, because they have a little twist to it creatively or visually. But I look forward to all the shows. Do you think at this point there are too many spinoffs of The Bachelor? I have no idea. They seem to be popular. So again, that's more in the hands of the network. But the casts are great. The casting's great. The producers are great. There are instances each season where contestants express specific opinions and thoughts they have, and after they say them, I just shout out at the TV, have you ever seen this show? (laughs) Examples of this include when contestants say they don't think they're ready for an engagement at the end of the season, or if they don't condone the lead being intimate with other contestants. As a director, do you hope for statements like these because they make the show more interesting and dramatic, or are you taken aback like myself because they know what they signed up for? I think it's actually sort of refreshing when there's people who have different experience levels with the show and different takes on the show. Sometimes you go in a little more naive, and it actually makes the experience more refreshing. Now let's move on to a studio-based reality show that you direct, Shark Tank, which first premiered on ABC back on August 9th, 2009. And I can still remember watching the premiere episode because it aired immediately after the first episode of the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire 10th Anniversary Celebration. Brad fact! Now, if I'm not mistaken, you've been directing Shark Tank pretty much since the beginning, correct? Yeah, I've done every episode since season one, but I didn't do the pilot. And over the last 11 years, Shark Tank has become a huge success. So did you ever imagine a show about entrepreneurs pitching ideas to investors would have become such a huge phenomenon and create a whole new genre of reality TV? Well, again, it's one of those things I just got out of the business of trying to guess anymore because no one knows. It's so hard to predict. But right around season three, we really took a turn, an uptick. And yeah, it's really part of the American conscience now. And everyone knows about the show and it reruns all over the place. And I absolutely love working on that show. So how much time does each entrepreneur have in front of the Sharks to pitch their product and hopefully get a deal? There's no real time limit. Sometimes it's a half an hour, sometimes it's an hour. The sharks have no idea what the companies are, so they need to really ask a lot of questions and do their discovery regarding the entrepreneur and the company before they're going to invest their own money. So that's really the secret to the show is that what you see on the air is cut down somewhat, but there's a little bit more that happens on stage because they're investing their own money and they need to have some questions answered. 
And how many total pitches do you typically go through in a Shark Tank shooting day? Some days we do a couple of episodes worth, about eight, sometimes nine or ten. It's like a full day, but it's so rewarding to see these people come out. Sometimes have their dreams crushed, and other times have their dreams answered, and it's just fascinating. It's a really smart show. The crew loves working on it because we all feel a little smarter at the end of the day. That's so funny that you say that because I always feel so much smarter after watching a full episode of Shark Tank. You know, before Shark Tank was on the air, I had no idea what a royalty was. And now, royalty is part of my daily lexicon. Next in the tank is Kevin O'Leary with a blood-sucking offer that will certainly make you file bankruptcy. And this is definitely a royalty deal, okay? Here's how it's going to work. I'm going to give you $100,000. you are going to pay me 10% of revenue. I'm going to go to a 4% on top of the university patent. And then I'm going to take a $3 royalty per unit because you can afford to give me that. After I get back four times my money, poof, I disappear. Boy, that's groundbreaking, Kevin. You've never done that before. Silence and learn. Exactly. No, it's really been fun. This is one of the biggest questions I've always had about the production of Shark Tank. When an entrepreneur comes through the doors, as a viewer, we see their product and any monitors or signage already in the Shark Tank and on full display for the sharks to see. So right before the entrepreneurs come out, is there a reveal so that in the moments leading up to the start of the pitch, the sharks aren't prejudging a product or company? Yeah, sometimes backstage we definitely keep them separate and we want that person to explain their product for the first time. Sometimes the sharks, they'll take a break or they'll come back and sit down and sometimes there'll be product out there. But in general, they're not analyzing that or paying attention to that. They're usually talking to their people or talking to each other or something. But yeah, that's something we like to have be fresh when the actual shooting starts. Although Shark Tank is filmed all in one studio, you have five sharks plus the entrepreneur in one space to get specific moments and reactions for the camera. And because the entrepreneurs are pitching in the moment, there really isn't any room to do any reaction pickup shots. So is it tough to direct Shark Tank because of how many people you have to constantly watch? It's not tough, but I have enough cameras for sure. The post department does a great job putting the show together and finding those moments. And we're just listening and trying to tell the story visually again. The camera guys are terrific. And we try to give it some movement and some life because it is five people sitting in chairs and one or two people standing on a rug. So we try to create a little dynamic feel to the proceedings with camera movement and other things. Editing is really critical. It certainly is. Now, there are many times when a shark asks an entrepreneur about their backstory or to reveal a personal story about themselves. Are you the one prompting the sharks to ask these questions to the entrepreneurs? No, I very rarely talk to them at all. Again, it's sort of like Bachelor and that it's sort of a reality show and that the best television is going to be their best, most honest interaction. So we really let them go, and like I said, some of what they ask and some of what they get into doesn't necessarily make the show, but they need to go down that road for their own purposes. So far be it from us to tell Shark what's important to them. From a director's point of view and not a business point of view, what makes for a great Shark Tank pitch? It's really just the honesty and vulnerability and that story of that person, how they got there and what they had to do to get there and what they've laid on the line and what they've sacrificed to be there and the emotion and just going for that journey and that ride with them. And then also just some fascinating people, brilliant people with brilliant ideas and really amazing products and apps and companies that learning more about is a thrill because these people are really different than me in terms of they have a different spirit about them. They take more risks and more chances to make things happen, and I really respect that. So it's all the same stuff that makes good TV, and you kind of know it when you see it. As you are directing Shark Tank pitches, do you find yourself yelling at the monitor, take the deal, or why are you asking for so much money? Oh, sure. Yeah, we get involved. Yeah, we love rooting for and against people. And I think you have to be a fan of the show and a fan of television to work in it. You know, I think that helps if you can bring some kind of your own average Joe watching at home attitude towards it. Now, Ken, if you were pitching a product on Shark Tank, which shark or sharks would you like to partner with most? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't know. I think they've all had success. For sure. And personally, I really enjoy their company. I really love them all. They're really dear, sweet people and very, very smart. 
So I guess it would just depend. I would work with any of them in a second. But honestly, I think that people are thrilled to have that partnership. And like I said, I think they've all been successful. And what's fun now is that guest sharks are being brought in on many of the episodes. Yeah, right. We sprinkle in some guest sharks every season. Does the seating placement of the guest shark have to do with the best fit for getting them to look their best on camera? That is something I'm not involved with because for the most part, we can make anyone look great in any seat. Well, Ken, if you can make anyone look good in any seat, I guess I can be a shark if I wanted to. You could be a shark. You have to come visit. I would love to come visit Shark Tank. I'll let you know when I'm in L.A. Next, let's talk about Family Feud, which I know you've been directing since the premiere of the Richard Karn version back in 2002. Brad fact. Yeah, Feud. Amazing. 20 seasons I've been doing it, syndicated, and now we've done six years of Celebrity Feud. And I did four years with Richard Karn, four years with John O'Hurley, and I guess this will be my 12th year with Steve Harvey. And it's just taken off. It's a huge, huge, huge phenomenon. As a fan of game shows growing up, when you got the offer to direct Family Feud, a game show classic and one of the best game shows of all time, I'm sure it was a dream come true, correct? Oh, yeah. It's such a classic. It really is a thrill. And we keep a lot of the original music and we hearken back to some of the early years with some of the stuff that we've kept in place. It's just a great show. And Steve's obviously brought so much to it, but it's such a great format. And speaking of hearkening back to the earlier years, I was thrilled back in 2006 during the premiere episode of John O'Hurley's hosting run when I saw that the set had been redone to look like a modern version of the original Family Feud set. Yes, we've had a lot of fun on the show over the years doing different specials and doing these celebrity shows is a blast. It's really, really fun. The Steve Harvey version of Family Feud has implemented a number of changes from previous versions of the show. The first change, which was introduced a couple years after Steve's 2010 premiere season, involved the remaining answers reveal. Now, when it comes time to revealing answers on the board that weren't guessed, Instead of going in chronological order, the unguessed answers are revealed in reverse chronological order, a la David Letterman's top 10 list. To me, the reverse chronological order reveal doesn't make sense with the concept of the game because the contestant's goal is to give the most popular answers. So the unguessed answers should always be revealed going from most popular to least popular. Plus, that's the way it's been done for years, so why change it? So Ken, I'm curious if you know the reason why this was changed. I think Steve just, it made sense to him to start doing it that way. And you're right, we used to do it the other way. And then Steve started doing it that way. And it was kind of fun to go backwards. And he just does it from the most obscure to the most obvious. And the studio audience seems to respond. Everyone seems to have a lot of fun that way. Another change implemented started with Steve's very first episode back in 2010. Now there are no more aired family introductions. Steve says the names of the two families competing, but we don't get to see the heads of the families introduce the names of their family members. I know that the family intros are filmed, and a portion is sometimes edited in and aired when Steve comes back around to the head of the family during a question. But for me, I always thought this wasn't the greatest idea because we don't get to connect with the players before the game starts. And when they are edited in, the continuity is off because the scores are not shown on the family's podium and Steve is not holding his question card. So I'm curious, does this change have to do with episode timing, or do you think the audience just doesn't want to spend time watching the family intros? No, I think it's just Steve's so funny. There's so much comedy. We're trying to keep as much as we can, and in a half-hour show, you don't have much time, and you got to keep all the questions and answers. So I think it more has to do with time. And plus, as a viewer, I think it's fun to get right into the first question as fast as possible. But no, we love meeting the families, too, and sometimes they're really interesting, and we like to keep that, and families are really the heart and soul of the show. When Steve Harvey began hosting Family Feud, the game itself drastically changed because the questions became raunchier. The two previous versions hosted by Richard Karn and John O'Hurley featured family-friendly questions and the game felt very classic. But with the Steve Harvey version, it almost feels like a different show. So I'm curious, Ken, what is your opinion on the raunchy material currently being used on Family Feud? I don't know that it is raunchier or whether we just live in a time where stuff that can be perceived as raunchier or it was a more innocent time. But growing up, I remember the Richard Dawson thing at the time, thinking even then that for its time, the material could be taken in a certain way as well. I'm not involved in the material, so I'm not sure exactly whether there's an actual change from the Richard and John years 
or whether it's more perception, but it certainly seems to be working as the show's more popular than ever. So I don't know what that means. On June 21st, 2015, ABC debuted Celebrity Family Feud with host Steve Harvey. And this was actually the first time Family Feud aired on ABC since the original Richard Dawson daytime version of Family Feud aired its final episode on June 14th, 1985. Almost exactly 30 years ago to the date. Brad fact. Is it more fun for you to direct Celebrity Family Feud because of all the star power on the stage and it's in prime time? Or the syndicated Family Feud because the families playing are trying to win money that could potentially change their lives? There is something nice about the syndicated version because the money is important. But the celebrities a blast just to see NFL players and heroes of mine and singers and actors. And sometimes they have really quirky, funny, real family members, too. But yes, they're playing for charity, which is a different dynamic. But that's nice, too. You know, it's nice to be working on a show where there's money going to charity. I like them both. I enjoy them both. But they're a little different. You're right about that. I understand that the money that the celebrity families win goes to charity, and the goal is for them to have the best chance to win fast money. However, when Family Feud had celebrity versions during the Richard Dawson and the Ray Combs era, the fast money questions were of the same difficulty as the regular games. But now, the celebrity fast money questions are significantly easier and have higher point value answers than a majority of the regular fast money games. I personally don't think it's fair, but I was curious about your point of view on this matter. That's a good question. I'm not really sure. I'm not involved in that part of it, so I wouldn't really be able to answer that. I think also we do 200 original half hours, so you're bound to see more people fail at Fast Money than the syndicated version. The premiere episode of Celebrity Family Feud Season 4 back in 2018 was a special one because Kanye West, Kim Kardashian West, and the West family faced off against the Kardashian family And for the first time ever, the one matchup lasted the entire hour-long episode. Was this always the plan for the whole premiere episode to be the West versus Kardashian feud, or was that decided in post-production? It was so good. We said, well, make this an hour. That's a luxury. We have that flexibility. Right. And what a lot of people might not remember is that back in 2008, NBC aired their own summertime version of Celebrity Family Feud hosted by Al Roker, And Kim Kardashian and the Kardashian family, including the head of the family, Bruce Jenner, competed on an episode. Brad fact! That's right, the Kardashian girls were on that one. Good call. Moving on from Family Feud, I have to ask you one question about the 2008 GSN special, Meow Mix, Think Like a Cat Game Show. Oh, yeah. Classic. That was classic. (laughs) The second round of the show was a cat trivia round called Think Like a Cat. But the board for the round was an exact copycat, pun intended, of the classic Jeopardy board from the 1964 to 1975 Art Fleming version, with six categories and point values ranging from 10 to 50. Brad fact! Did you ever question why the board was a copycat of the Jeopardy board? Oh, you know what's so funny? I don't remember that. I don't remember that detail. Well, even a lot of die-hard game show fans probably don't remember that detail either, so that's perfectly all right. Let's now talk about the Fox revival of Love Connection, which ran in the summers of 2017 and 2018 and was hosted by Andy Cohen. We are currently in the game show revival boom, and it wasn't a surprise that Fox wanted to get in the game after seeing how successful ABC had been with their summertime game show revivals. However, do you think Fox was trying to compete against ABC not only in the game show revival category, but the summertime dating show category? Because it brought back Love Connection during the same TV season as Bachelor in Paradise. I'm not really sure. I have no idea what goes on in those meetings or how they decide what shows to do. But I know that they were doing Shazam. So Shazam started at the same time. So maybe in some respects they wanted a companion game for that. But I have no idea. They're certainly completely different genres, Bachelor in Paradise and Love Connection. We did a couple of seasons of that and unfortunately haven't done more. So I thought that was really very good and Andy Cohen was excellent. There are two main questions I have regarding Love Connection. The first one is, during season one, when determining the order in which the three eligible contestants would reveal how their date went with the main contestant, photos of the three eligible contestants would appear on one of the video monitor bridges. Then they would shuffle around to reveal who would be first, second, and last. However, despite the illusion of the random shuffle, on most of the episodes, the order was the same order in which the three contestant bios were shown to the audience and the home viewers. 
Although it was changed for season two, my question is, what was the point of the contestants shuffling in season one if the order was going to be the same? You know what? I didn't even notice that. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't notice that. I think the shuffle was just a device to make it feel randomized. You notice everything, Bradley. Well, it's all these years of studying and analyzing game shows that I notice little details and formats and production elements. Yeah. My second main question is in regards to season two. Now, one of the biggest changes between the new Love Connection and the classic Love Connection was the addition of the $10,000 twist. In season one, if the main contestant chose the same person that the audience selected based on the bios, they would win $10,000. However, if the audience chose differently, the main contestant could either stay with the person they chose or go on an overnight date with the audience selection, but that would also mean that they win the $10,000. In season two, though, the option to switch and gain the $10,000 was eliminated, and you could only win the $10,000 if the audience selected the winning contestant from the bios. Brad fact! I personally love the $10,000 twist from season one, as it added a unique element to the end of each half, and provided a fun moment as a viewer. In addition, without the twist, the $10,000 really wasn't a necessary part of the show, and it felt like a pointless way to give out money. So why was the $10,000 twist eliminated in Season 2? You know what? I'm really not sure. I'm trying to remember back now. It's been a few years. I think there may have been a disincentive to continue on the date or the relationship. The money was misleading or misguiding people. But I can't remember now what the conversations were. Again, that was really on the executive producer level. Sometimes what you and I appreciate and the gamesmanship and the strategy that we see in a game doesn't always necessarily translate to average Joe, regular people when they are actually on the show. That's yeah. why people sit at home and go, why did you do that? Don't do that. Don't pass. Strategies we know that aren't sound, people take part in all the time because they're not game show nerds like us. And that's why more people need to become game show nerds like us. Yeah. The next show I want to briefly talk about is the 2011 ABC game show, You Deserve It, which involved contestants figuring out who, what, or where subjects with clues that they could buy using the total money they could earn in each round. However, the whole premise of the game is that each contestant is playing for someone they know, and all the money that they win will be given to the person of their choosing. Chris Harrison, who I've had the pleasure of having on the game show, was the host of You Deserve It, and of course, he's also the host of The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. So was it a surreal experience working with Chris Harrison in a setting that wasn't a lavish Los Angeles mansion and didn't involve rose ceremonies? No, he's so great. We're friends, but also he just can host anything. He's such a great on-camera talent. He's smart. He picks up games well. He's a pleasure to work with. He's such a pro. I was actually surprised that You Deserve It only lasted for one season consisting of six episodes because I actually thought the trivia aspect of the show was quite good. I did not do the six episodes. I just did the pilot. Oh, I see. But I do remember that ABC ended up airing the pilot as part of one of the episodes. Brad fact! Interesting. I was not even aware of that. No, I thought that was a really sweet show with good-natured purpose. The last show I want to talk about is, of course, The Misery Index, which, as I said earlier, is the show where you and I met because we both worked on it. You as the director and me as a production assistant. For those of you who don't know, The Misery Index is a TBS game show hosted by actress Jamila Jamil and featuring the Tenderloins, a.k.a. the Impractical Jokers, Sal Volcano, Joe Gatto, James Murray, and Brian Quinn. Each of the two contestants gets partnered up with a pair of tenderloins who help them rate unfortunate human events and situations on a scale of 1 to 100, based on how miserable they think a group of psychologists graded them. Welcome to the Misery Index, where you can make a fortune from other people's misfortune. So that's murder, then? Where's that rate on the index? Now, Ken, when you first heard that the Impractical Jokers were getting their own game show, what was your initial reaction? The second season was my first season, so I had the luxury of watching the first season. And I think it's hilarious. They're so funny, and they're so good together, playing off each other. And then you just sort of add a little game element on top of it, and it's quite chock-full half-hour of fun and game. I was very, very pleased, and I really enjoyed working with them. I thought they're terrific on the show, and it's kind of nice. They give some sound advice, they give some comedy, and I think it's really going to be a hit show for many years. 
When you see the events and situations appear on the board as you are directing each episode, is this the first time you are seeing them? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, we run through them in the booth. We do a little tech rehearsal in the morning, which I'm sometimes paying more attention to, or sometimes I'm involved in other stuff. But my AD goes through them all. So some of them I've seen, some of them I'm a little familiar with, some I'm less familiar with. And what typically goes through your mind when you see some of these miserable events? Well, if nothing else, you play along. As you know, that's always the key to the best game, the play along ability. And I sit there and it's silly and you're like, okay, what is it going to fall on the scale? And everybody, the crew and everybody in the booth and anybody watching those things is going to say, that's a 42, that's a 61, that's a 90. It's just fun and silly. And that's the first sign of a good game is play along ability. You mentioned that choosing the correct person during to tell the truth tapings is tough for you. But I want to know, do you do well rating the events on the Misery Index? No, I'm terrible. I'm all over the place. But I have to say, by the end of the season, I got better. And listening to the Tenderloins was interesting because they've now done it for two seasons. So they sort of have an understanding of how the index works and where things might fall. So I sort of started figuring out some of their strategies from listening to them. But no, I was all over the place. It sort of takes the best elements of watching America's Funny Home Videos and then adding this very simple game on top of it, but not so simple in that I was wrong more often than not. I certainly was wrong with my Misery Index guesses for many of the events as well. So, Ken, before we get to the game, my last question is, what has been your favorite reality show and your favorite game show that you have directed during your career so far? Oh, that's a really good question. I'm happy with The Bachelor in the reality world. In the game show world, I really, really enjoyed Deal or No Deal with Howie Mandel. That was a great show. I was really hoping we'd do 10 more years of that, but we only did one for CNBC. But, you know, there's sort of a combination of game and reality and variety for the little bit of talent or some other wackiness and comedy and talk. You know, if I can laugh and cry and be entertained in a half an hour, even while I'm directing it, then that's a home run. And all the really good shows have those elements combined. Deal or No Deal, in a strange way, had really struck home with me as something that had some really heartfelt stuff with Howie and the contestants and their families and their stories. The comedy, of course. The gameplay is very simple and very fun. And the uh, entertainment value, because the producers were great at bringing in other elements just to ramp up the entertainment value. Well, Ken, we have reached my favorite portion of the game show, where I get to create and host a Bradley Clark original game for my guests to play. And as I said at the top of this episode, I have decided to bring back a show from your game show directing past for you to play. It's time for the game of the day. Game of the day. And Ken, I can reveal to you now that the game I am bringing back is one that we talked about not too long ago. It is the six-episode ABC classic from 2011. We are about to play You Deserve It. You Deserve It. And in honor of the game being You Deserve It, the background music for the game will be the Pet Shop Boys tune, What Have I Done to Deserve This? And here's how we play You Deserve It. Just like on the real show, you'll be playing five rounds, each increasing in total point value. Your job in each round is to guess the correct answer to a who, what, or where subject using up to the 10 clues that I can provide. The first clue is always free, but in order to receive another clue, you're going to have to pay for it. The point total for each round is divided into nine amounts, and if you want to purchase a clue, you'll choose one of the nine numbered cards in front of me. The points attached to that card will then be subtracted from the round's point total. As soon as you want to make a guess, you can, but be careful because you only get one guess per round. If you are correct, you bank the points you earn that round, but an incorrect answer means you bank nothing for that round. All of the subjects will be game show related, and after five rounds, Ken, if you have banked 125,000 points or more, you will be deemed a winner. Those are all the rules. Ken, are you ready to play a game you directed almost a decade ago? I'm ready. Then let's play You Deserve It. Remember, you need 125,000 banked points by the end of the fifth round. And let's begin with round one. 
The first round is worth up to 10,000 points, and the nine point values that 10,000 points is divided into are as follows. 100 points, 200 points, 300 points, 400 points, 500 points, 1,000 points, 2,000 points, 2,500 points, and 3,000 points. The subject category for your first round is... Who? And Ken, this is your free clue to figure out the who. Ball. That's B-A-L-L, ball. Now remember, you only get one guess per round, so use that guess wisely. So Ken, do you need another clue? I do need another clue. What number would you like? Four. Number four is worth... 2,500 points, but you still have 7,500 points left, and here is your clue. Three-time winner. So you have ball and three-time winner. Let's see, the ball. Three-time winner. I'm going to need another clue. What number? Seven. Seven is worth... Ooh, 3,000 points. Ooh. But still, 4,500 points if you answer correctly using this clue. 1973 to 1988. So you have ball, three-time winner, and 1973 to 1988. God, I am not going to have the deep game show historical knowledge that you are. One more clue. All right, what number? Nine. Number nine is worth 500 points. Not bad at all. So for 4,000 points, the clues you have so far are ball, three-time winner, 1973 to 1988, and now this clue. So long. Oh, Bradley, you stumped me. Do you need another clue? Yes, give me another clue. Two. Two is worth 2,000 points. Ooh. So to put 2,000 points in your bank, here's your next clue. Geometric structure. Boy, these aren't helping me at all. I'm still drawing a blank. Another clue? Yeah. All right, what number? Three. Number three is worth 300. Good. The clue is... Teenager. Teenager. One more clue. All right. What number, Ken? Eight. Number eight is worth 200. So for 1,500 points, Ken, here is your next clue. Bandstand. I want to say Dick Clark. You want to lock that in? Yeah. For 1,500 points. Is it Dick Clark? Yes, it is. All right. Ball was a reference to New Year's Eve, the ball in Times Square. Of course. Three-time winner was in reference to Dick Clark's three Emmy wins. Of course. 1973 to 1978, those were the years Dick Clark hosted Pyramid. Brad fact. And geometric structure related to Pyramid as well. Also, Dick Clark was known as America's oldest teenager, and he also hosted American Bandstand. Of course. All right, Ken, so after round one, you've banked 1,500 points, which is better than nothing. And don't get discouraged because you still have up to four more rounds to reach the 125,000-point goal. Okay. It's time for round two. The second round is worth up to 25,000 points. And here are the nine point values the 25,000 points is divided into. 100 points, 200 points, 300 points, 400 points, 1,500 points, 4,000 points, 5,000 points, 6,000 points, and 7,500 points. The subject category for round two is... Where? Okay. And this is your free clue, Ken. Gilmore Stadium. That's your free clue. Gilmore Stadium. Okay. Do you need a clue? Yeah, I need a clue. Okay, what number? Four. Number four, and behind number four is... 200. Very good. Good. All right, and your clue is... Originally, there were four. Gilmore Stadium, and originally, there were four. I'm going to need another clue. Seven. Number seven. All right, let's see how many points you'll be losing this time. 5,000. So 19,800 points are left, and this is your next clue. 
a true showcase of TV. And the word showcase is in quotation marks. So you have Gilmore Stadium. Originally, there were four and a true showcase of TV. Well, that sounds like let's make a deal. Give me another clue. All right, another clue. What number? Nine. Number nine is worth 400 points. Very good. So for 19,400 points, here is your clue. The I. That would be CBS. A where? Oh, I know. I got it. CBS Television City. Are you locking that in? Locked in. For 19,400 points, is it CBS Television City? It is Television City. All right. Nice job, Ken. It only took you four clues. And by the way, Gilmore Stadium was actually a football field and racetrack that Television City was built over. Brad fact. The clue originally there were four was in reference to Television City originally only having four sound stages. Brad fact. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. A true showcase of TV was a pun on The Price is Right, which is filmed at Television City. And the I is, of course, the CBS logo. Right. Awesome. So after two rounds, Ken, you have banked 20,900 points. Wow. And it's time for round three. The third round is worth up to 50,000 points. And these are the nine point values the 50,000 points is divided into. 500 points, 1,000 points, 1,500 points, 3,000 points, 5,000 points, 6,000 points, 8,000 points, 10,000 points, and 15,000 points. The subject category for round three is... Who? And Ken, this is your free clue for round three. A frequent fill-in. That's a frequent fill-in. Frequent fill-in. Okay, I'll take number five. Number five is... 8,000. But let's see if you can bank 42,000 points using this clue. A degree in economics. Well, I have a degree in economics, but it's not me. I'll give you that. The answer is not you, Ken. Who would it be? A host? I'm going to need another clue. All righty. What number? Let's say nine. All right. Number nine is worth 500. Very good. Oh, good. That's the lowest one on the board. So 41,500 points. The clue is winner take all. And that's in quotation marks. A frequent fill-in, degree in economics, and winner take all. Uh, I'm going to need another clue. Let's say one. Number one. All right. Let's see what that's worth. 3,000. Not bad. So for 38,500 points, your next clue is... Two heads are better than one. Gosh, I am still lost. No worries. You can take oh. another clue. There's still low values huh. on the board. All right. Another clue. What number? Let's say three. Three is 1,000. That was the next lowest, so very good. Good. So for 37,500 points, let's try to figure out the who with this clue. The password is producer. Oh, my God. I don't know. Let's see. Who was the producer of password that sometimes filled in and had a major in economics? Two heads are better than one. The producer of Password. I'm not going to get it. I don't know. Would you like another clue? Yeah, one more clue. Okay. Four. You selected four, and that is worth... 6,000. That's perfectly all right, because you can bank 31,500 points using this clue. The Price is Right and Family Feud. Well, it's not Richard Dawson... It's not Bob Barker. Who owns those shows? Oh, I've got an answer. All right, what is it? Who is Mark Goodson? You locking in that? Locked. For 31,500 points, is it Mark Goodson? It is Mark Goodson. All right. Those 31,500 points are now added to your 20,900 points you've already banked, which means, Ken, after three rounds, you have banked 52,400 points. You are 72,600 points away from a win, and let me quickly go over the clues. 
frequent fill-in was a reference to Mark Goodson filling in as a panelist on What's My Line, Match Game, and To Tell the Truth. Mark earned a degree in economics from the University of California, Berkeley in 1937. Brad fact! Winner Take All was the first game show he produced. Brad fact! Two Heads Are Better Than One was a reference to Mark Goodson's longtime producing partner, Bill Todman, as well as a reference to a game show of theirs, Blockbusters. And Mark Goodson produced Password, The Price is Right, and Family Feud. So with those Brad facts out of the way, let's carry on with round four. The fourth round is worth up to 100,000 points. And these are the nine point values that 100,000 points is divided into. 1,000 points, 2,000 points, 3,000 points, 4,000 points, 10,000 points, 12,500 points, 17,500 points, 20,000 points, and 30,000 points. The subject category this time around is... What? And Ken, this is your free clue. The first guy didn't need any. Okay. And I'm presuming you need a clue. So which number first, Ken? Clue number four. Clue number four is worth... 2,000. And the clue is... A fourth was added in 2004. I'm going to need another clue. I'll take number three. All right, number three. 4,000. Very good. The clue is, they help you in the chair. They help you in the chair. It must be like a clue or something. I'll take one more. All right. Number eight. Number eight. 1,000 points. You're getting good at picking the low numbers, Ken. So for 93,000 points, here is your clue. The audience could get involved. Oh, I got it. Lifeline. You want to lock that in? Lock. All right, Ken, since 93,000 points are available, this is for the win. So, to win this game of You Deserve It, is it Lifeline? Yes, you got it, Ken. You have won this game of You Deserve It. Yes, the trusty lifeline from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire was the answer. The first guy didn't need any was in reference to John Carpenter, Millionaire's first ever million dollar winner, who used no lifelines during his game, except on the million dollar question when he used his phone a friend to call his father to tell him that he was going to win the million dollars. Brad fact! A fourth was added in 2004 was in reference to a fourth lifeline, switch the question, being added to the original three lifelines in 2004 once a contestant reached the $25,000 threshold. Brad fact. They help you in the chair was a reference to the hot seat and the audience could get involved was in reference to the ask the audience lifeline. Right. So Ken, with the 93,000 points you just banked, your total for the game is over the 125,000 point target. You have banked a superb score of 145,400 points. confetti i hope you had fun playing a game that you directed super fun yeah super fun and that was the game of the day you deserve it you deserve it well ken it has been an absolute pleasure getting the chance to talk with you about the many game shows and reality tv shows you've directed over the course of your career so far So thank you so much for joining me today as my guest on The Game Show. My pleasure. And Ken, you always have an open invitation to come back on another episode of The Game Show to talk more about your directing career or if you just want to play another game. Thank you, Bradley. I'm so flattered. All right, Ken. Thank you again for joining me on The Game Show today. It's been a true pleasure chatting with you. My pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, I really feel miserable saying this, but we've sadly reached the end of this episode of The Game Show. My thanks once again to game show and reality TV show director Ken Fuchs for being my special guest today. Now, Ken has had the pleasure of directing a few of my other special guests that I've had on the game show, including the host of The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, Chris Harrison, and former Family Feud host, John O'Hurley. You can check out both Chris and John's episodes, as well as all of my other episodes of the game show, by logging on to www.soundcloud.com slash Bradley underscore Clark 
That's B-R-A-D-L-E-Y underscore C-L-A-R-K-E slash sets slash the game show. That's www.soundcloud.com slash Bradley underscore Clark. That's B-R-A-D-L-E-Y underscore C-L-A-R-K-E slash sets slash the game show. Plus, don't forget to like The Game Show Starring Bradley Clark on Facebook and follow The Game Show Starring Bradley Clark on Twitter using the handle at TheGameShowBC and hashtag TheGameShow. And of course, be sure to tune in next time for another exciting episode of The Talk Show, all about the world of television game and competition shows, The Game Show. I'm Bradley Clark, the Bradster, and I've got a pitch meeting with Mark Cuban and Robert Herjavec in 10 minutes that I really don't want to be late for. Bye for now. All of The Bachelor and You Deserve It cuts and sounds are courtesy of the ABC Television Network. This edition of The Game Show was created and produced by Bradley Clark and was recorded at the WRHU Studios. This is Austin Angelo speaking. The Game Show is a Bradley Clark production. Get your game on.